Harry is mad. Most people walk downstairs, putting one foot more or less carefully in front of the other, and perhaps holding on to the banisters. Not Harry Holdsworth. Oh, no, not he. Long hours of practice had made Harry expert in unusual methods of getting from the upper to the ground floor of the Holdsworth's house. Some were comparatively simple. Sliding down the banisters, for example, or rolling down the stairs, or hopping down them, feet together, one step at a time. Hopping down but missing out every other step was a good deal more difficult and could be made harder still by doing it with hands in pockets and eyes shut. Harry only attempted this last combination when something told him it was going to be a very special sort of day. On this particular morning, something told him. He was about halfway down the staircase when suddenly it all happened. Below him, he heard his mother's voice calling, Breakfast! as she came from the kitchen with a loaded tray. Behind him, he heard his father say, oh, Mind out of the way, Harry, I'm late already. And right in the middle of jump number five, the postman rang the doorbell. The dog barked madly, as it always did when the doorbell rang, and the cat dashed upstairs, as it always did when the dog barked madly, just in time to receive jump number six on the end of its tail. Jump number seven took Harry straight into the breakfast tray. As the yells of the departing cat and the crash and tinkle of breaking china died away, there reigned for a moment a horrid silence, interrupted only by the slurping of the dog licking up the raspberry jam. The breath knocked out of him. Harry lay flat upon the hall floor as his parents gazed resignedly down at him. Then, through the letter flap, there sailed a large envelope which settled like a bird landing on Harry's chest. It was a heavy, official-looking envelope bearing a number of stamps. The stamps were American ones. It was addressed to Mr. Harry Holdsworth. "'It's from America,' said Harry, when at last they were all sitting down to a hastily eaten breakfast. "'I don't know anybody in America.' It "'Must be from Uncle George,' said Mr. Holdsworth, with his mouth full. "'Who's he?' "'My father's eldest brother.' Went out there as a young man. Finished up as a university professor. Must be, ooh, ninety-something by now. You'll have to tell me about it this evening, Harry. I'm going to be late. I must go. And he drained his coffee and went. Harry slit open the envelope with a buttery knife. He took out a sheaf of papers. On the top sheet was written, Will Holsworth. Funny, said Harry. I thought Dad said his name was George. It is, said his mother. Can I see? She held out her hand for the papers. It was, she said. This is a copy of his last will and testament. She skimmed hastily through a covering letter from a firm of New York attorneys, then glanced at her watch. There's a clause in it somewhere that refers to you, but honestly, we haven't got time to look at it now. You must get off to school. We'll go through it when Dad comes back this evening and see what it's all about. I expect he's left you some little keepsake. All through that day at school... Harry's imagination, always fertile, ran riot. Some little keepsake indeed. The fact of the matter is, he told himself, that I've been left something in the will of my very old, very important American great-uncle. Huh. Well, to begin with, all Americans are rich. Everyone knows that. And as he lived a ninety-something, he would have had all that time to build up a huge store of wealth, thousands and thousands of pounds, dollars, I mean. In fact, he'd be pretty well bound to be a millionaire. A multimillionaire, I should think. Ooh, probably three or four houses, all with swimming pools and a ranch and his own powerboat and his own private jet. Perhaps he's left me that. I better could soon learn to fly one. By the end of the school day, Harry had convinced himself that this fabulously rich great-uncle had, by some quirk of fate, left him everything that he possessed. Harry was not by nature a particularly greedy boy, but he was a fanciful one, and by now he had gone beyond the three great houses and the speedboat and the executive jet. In addition, he thought, he might well receive the largest custom-built Cadillac ever made— 
and a couple of Rolls Royces for occasional use. And of course, the wealth wouldn't consist only of boring old dollar bills. There would probably be an actual treasure chest, overflowing with diamonds and rubies and emeralds and showers of gold and silver coins. Once home, he looked again at his letter from America, but the language of the will was so full of whereases and heretofores and hereuntos and aforesaids that he decided to leave it until his father came back from work. He filled in the time by adding to Great Uncle George's stable a 1,000cc Harley Davidson bike, well, an old model that he rode when he was younger, and making a noisy circuit of the house. Harry, his mother said, as he roared along the passage between kitchen and sitting room, could you do that up in your room, please? She spoke with infinite patience, acquired from ten years' experience of being Harry's mother. Vroom, vroom, shouted Harry as he twisted the throttle wide open and set the Harley Davidson at the stairs. Don't worry, Mum, he thought. I'll soon buy you a bigger house, and I can have one of the Rolls Royces. When at last he heard the sound of his father's five-year-old Ford, he came downstairs the fastest way, banisters, in a fever of excitement. Dad, Great Uncle George is dead! What do you think? That letter, it was a will! I can't understand what it's about. Can you read it for me? Come on, Mum, Dad's going to read it! And Mr. Holsworth sat down at the table and spread out the papers. For a while, he read in silence. Then he began to chuckle. <laughs> what is it? asked Mrs. Holsworth. Has he left Harry something? Yes. Yes, he has. His fortune, cried Harry. His fortune, said his father. No such luck, Harry. The old boy didn't have a lot of money, and what he did have, he's left to the university library. No. He's left you what appears to have been his most cherished possession. What's that? His parrot. <laughs> to my great-nephew, Harry Holsworth, whom I have never had the pleasure of meeting, I hereby bequeath my faithful companion of these past forty years the African Grey Parrot, answering to the name of Madison. I make this bequest to the aforesaid Harry Holsworth because he chances to be my only male relative of an age that I consider suitable, bearing in mind that Madison A may live to twice his present span, and B, like me, he has not been used to females. It went on to detail the provisions that Great Uncle George had made to ensure that Harry should not be out of pocket by reason of his legacy. The airfare's paid, said Mr. Holsworth, and there's a sum of money to cover the purchase of a large parrot cage and the cost of the creature's food for a year by Uncle George's reckoning. After that time, you're on your own. For another forty years, said Harry. You mean, I've got to keep this bird, and it might live till I'm fifty. Perhaps it'll die before then, darling, said his mother soothingly. You never know, said his father. You may actually like the thing. Perhaps it'll talk. Uncle George was a pretty brilliant sort of chap in his day, I believe. Linguistics, that was his line. What's linguistics? The study of language. All about words, in fact. The parrot's sure to have picked up a few. Perhaps I could take it to school, Harry said, brightening up. On my shoulder, like that man in Treasure Island. You're not taking it anywhere, said his mother. This weekend, you and Daddy can go and buy a proper parrot cage. I'm not having that thing make a filthy mess all over the house. Might be house-trained, said Harry, hopefully. News had come from New York of the parrot's time of arrival at London Airport, and now the Holsworth family waited, with mixed emotions. The whole business, both parents felt, was a great nuisance. Why on earth couldn't old Uncle George have left the bird to a zoo or something? It wouldn't be so bad, they said to each other, if Harry was wildly excited about it, or even moderately happy. As it was, he just looked gloomy. And gloomy Harry was, as he waited for that ring on the doorbell that would herald the delivery van, bringing his companion of the next forty years. Buying the cage had been quite fun. There was plenty of money allowed for it, Dad said, so they'd bought a huge one like a miniature aviary that hung on a spring from a tall stand. But the more Harry looked at it that morning, 
its hoppers filled with seed and water, its floor sanded, its door opened in readiness. The more he worried. The doorbell rang. Peering into the travelling box, standing now on a table in the sitting room, they could see through the ventilation grill a shadowy shape. No sound came from within, but a scrape of claws on the floor of the box. He's alive, said Harry. He sounded disappointed. Let's get the poor old thing out of it, said his father. He's had a long trip. Open the lid, Harry. He might fly away. Shouldn't think so. After all, he's just flown three thousand miles. Must be tired. <laughs> Go on, open it up. Doubtfully, Harry undid the catch and raised the lid. He pulled his hand away sharply, as though the travelling box contained not a parrot, but a poisonous snake. For a minute or so, nothing happened. Then out of the box, in silent slow motion, there rose a round grey head with a sharp hooked beak. On either side of the head was a bright, considering, straw-coloured eye. One of these eyes considered Harry carefully, noting his smallish, rather skinny frame, his mop of bright red hair, his jug-handle ears. Then, levering itself up by gripping the rim of the box with its bill, the parrot climbed out and walked across the table with a rolling sailor's gait. Harry backed away. It seems to know you, his mother said. Don't be frightened, his father said. It, it won't hurt you. How do you know, said Harry. Put your hand out. See if it'll walk up your arm. You put your hand out. No, it's your parrot. Speak to it, said his mother. Say its name. Harry looked at the bird, which had now stopped at the edge of the table and was standing, looking up at him, his head cocked to one side. All he could think of was what a large, sharp beak it had, and what cruel, curved talons on its scaly feet. He shut his eyes tight, and put his hand on the tabletop. Hello, Madison! Very gently, the parrot stepped onto Harry's arm. Very gently, it climbed slowly up and perched on his shoulder. Very gently, it nibbled the lobe of his ear. Harry opened his eyes, and a grin of relief spread across his face. He likes you, his mother said. He's nice, his father said. Hello, Madison, said Harry again. The parrot said nothing. Perhaps he'll talk once he's had something to eat, said Mr. Holdsworth. Stick him in the cage, Harry. He must be hungry. And indeed, as soon as Harry moved to the parrot cage and stood beside its open door, the bird stepped off his shoulder and waddled inside. It drank thirstily and then settled down to eat, cracking up sunflower seeds in that powerful beak, and watching them all, with one or other pale, intelligent-looking eye. But despite all their efforts to encourage it during the remainder of that first day, it uttered no sound. Harry woke with a start. He looked at the luminous face of his watch. It was 5.30. Outside, the day was thinking of getting light. He lay still for a while. OK. Great Uncle George doesn't seem to have taught Madison anything, but there's no reason why I shouldn't. They're only mimics, after all. Not intelligent creatures, just good at copying. All you have to do is keep on saying the same thing over and over again. And sooner or later they catch on. About a hundred times should be enough, I should think. And when they've got it, you teach them something else. I'll start now. It's Sunday. Mum and Dad won't be getting up for ages. It's a good time. What shall I start with? I know. I'll teach him to say his name. Uh, but then it's no good just getting him to say Madison. That'd be like me going about saying Harry to people. No, I know. I'll train him to say... My name is Madison. Harry jumped out of bed, put on his dressing gown, opened the door, and for once went down the stairs slowly and quietly. Closing the sitting room door behind him, he went over to the parrot cage and stood beside it. It was on a level with his head. Harry took a deep breath. A hundred times, he said to himself, I'll say it 
a hundred times. He leant forward till his lips were almost against the wire bars of the cage, as close as possible to where he thought the bird's ear must be, and speaking slowly and clearly, as you would to a foreigner or to someone rather deaf, he said, My name is Madison. The parrot scratched the side of his bare, scaly face with one foot. If you say so, buddy, but that'd be a pretty remarkable coincidence, seeing that my name is Madison also. Harry's mouth fell open. He felt amazement, embarrassment, wild excitement, all at the same time. What's the matter? said Madison pleasantly. Cat got your tongue? Y y you can talk? said Harry at last. Uh-huh. Properly? Sure. Maybe I might differently from you, seeing I was raised in America, but boy, I sure can talk. But I, I, I thought parrots could only say a few words. Depends on how well they've been taught. I spent all my life with a professor of linguistics. Dead now, but what a guy. Great Uncle George. George Holdsworth was your great uncle? You're a Holdsworth? Yes, he, he left you to me in his will. Madison scratched the other side of his face. Gee, he said, that explains it all. They shoved me in that box, drove me to the airport, and next thing I know I'm at Heathrow. Madison Holdsworth, I said to myself, it's London Zoo for you, I guess. Instead of which, I'm back with the family. Boy, am I glad to be here. He cocked an eye at the ceiling. Thanks, George, he said. Why did Great Uncle George call you Madison? Harry asked. James Madison. Fourth President of the United States of America, from 1809 to 1817. Came after Thomas Jefferson and before James Monroe. Oh, why did he call you after the fourth president? Simple. I was his fourth parrot. Washington died in his sleep, Adams got pneumonia, and Jefferson tangled with the cat. Harry opened the cage door, and the parrot climbed out and up on his shoulder. What else can you do, Madison? I can read, Harry. Um, let's see. I can play the piano a bit. Camp down races, Swanee River, that kind of thing. With your feet? With my beak. Oh, and I can use the telephone. One thing I can't do is write. Never been able to hold a pen or pencil properly. Gosh, said Harry. Wait till I tell them at school. He felt the parrot's claws tighten a little on his shoulder, and then Madison said, Ah, uh, listen, Harry. Something tells me we're going to get along real fine. I guess there's a little matter we gotta get straight right now. This business of me being, well, different from the average parrot. Yes? Keep it to yourself, Harry. George did. All those years he never told a living soul. He reckoned that if it ever got out, we'd have every newspaper man and television interviewer in the States down on us. Not to mention scientists wanting to test me or showmen trying to steal me. We just kept it to ourselves. Why do you say you and I do the same? Yes, said Harry. He sounded doubtful. You sound doubtful, Madison said. Well, it's just that it was just the two of you, wasn't it? You and Great Uncle George. Uh-huh. Well, you see, there's Mum and Dad. They live here, too. Oh, sure, said Madison. We'll let them into the secret. Sure we will. They can keep a secret, I imagine. Oh, yes, Harry said. He grinned and without really thinking what he was doing, reached up to his shoulder and stroked the round grey head with his fingertips. But let's not tell them straight away. Let's have a bit of fun first. OK, Madison? Sure, Harry. I'll play it any way you want. Thanks, Madison. And by the way, George always used to call me Mad for short. You're welcome to do the same. Thanks, Mad. You must miss him a lot. I do hope you like it here. You bet your life, the parrot said. He nibbled gently at the boy's ear. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure, said Harry's mad. Sunday mornings followed a regular routine in the Holesworth house, Breakfast was always boiled egg. Afterwards, it was Harry's job to clear the table and wash up, while his mother and father went to the sitting room, she to read her book, 
he to do the Sunday Times crossword. Harry was expected to leave his parents in peace and amuse himself. On the whole, Harry was fairly good at amusing himself, but there were often times, especially on Sunday mornings, when he thought to have a friend to talk to, to play with, would be nice. Now, he was thinking, as he finished the washing up, I've got one. He made the mugs of coffee and took them to the sitting room. On the sofa, his mother turned the pages of her book. In his favourite chair, his father frowned at the crossword puzzle, his pencil tap-tapping against his teeth. In his cage, Madison sat silent. Thank you, said Mrs. Hillsworth. Have you done the washing up, darling? Yes. Thanks, said Mr. Hillsworth. Uh, are you any good at anagrams, Harry? No! Madison gave a loud squawk. I hope that bird's not going to make a filthy row all morning, Mr. Hillsworth said. I shan't be able to concentrate on this crossword. Uh, I'll, I'll take him up to my room, shall I, Dad? said Harry quickly. Good idea. For the rest of the morning, and at every possible opportunity during the days that followed, and there were plenty, it was half term, Harry and Mad talked and talked. In the safety of Harry's bedroom, or wherever they were sure they could not be overheard, they jabbered away nineteen to the dozen. Forty years in the company of Professor George Holdsworth had given Madison a great liking for the art of conversation. Harry learnt a lot about baseball and American football and life in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a little about Madison. Madison learnt a little about cricket and soccer and life in Greenwich, England, and a lot about Harry. There were so many questions to be asked. "'How old are you, Harry?' was one of the first from Madison. Ten. Ten, eh? Ah, oh, that's great. That's swell. Why? Well, you got to appreciate that your great-uncle George was over fifty years of age when I first chipped my way out of my egg. So... I spent all my grown-up life with an old man. Oh, don't get me wrong, Harry. George was a great guy. I'll never forget him. But he slowed up a lot towards the end. It's gonna be a whole heap of fun living with someone your age. And as well as talk, there was play. What sort of games do you like playing, Mad? Harry asked. You mean football and stuff? Guess I ain't built for that, Harry. No, no, I mean games that you and I can play together. You, you know, like cards. Now, cards, said Madison, are real tricky. Trouble is, my foot ain't designed for holding a playing card any more than a pencil, let alone managing a deck of cards or shuffling or dealing. No, what I like are board games, you know, w where I can use my beak to pick up the pieces. George and I used to play a lot. You mean like dominoes? Yeah. Drafts? Drafts? Never heard tell of that. Harry fetched a box of draftsmen and a board from the cupboard where he kept all his toys. These. Oh, checkers! That's what we call it? Yeah, sure, we play checkers. I don't suppose you know how to play chess. Madison put his head on one side and looked quizzically at Harry. Oh, why not, boy? Because... Harry was thinking. It's crazy to imagine a bird playing chess. It's just too difficult. Ha, ha, ha. There's nothing too difficult about the rules of chess, Harry, chuckled Madison. It's playing the game well that's hard. A couple of days later, Mrs. Holdsworth came suddenly into the room when Madison had that instant picked up his queen. A quick as a flash, he juggled the piece into his mouth. Ha, anyone would think you were playing chess with Madison, said Harry's mother. They would, wouldn't they, Mum? You haven't swallowed the thing, have you, Mad? said Harry when she had gone. You'd better check. Exactly what I'm going to do, said Madison, producing the Queen from her hiding place and making his move. And what's more, Harry boy, I kind of think that this is checkmate. I found Harry playing chess against himself today, his mother said later to his father. He'd even stood that bird at the other side of the board, pretending it was his opponent, I suppose. Harry spends his time in a land of make-believe, his father said. For the whole of that first week, Harry derived enormous enjoyment from the concealment of the parrot's powers of speech. Part of him longed to see the look on his parents' faces when the secret was revealed, but it was such fun fooling them. 
At the end of each day, he would lie in bed, hugging himself with glee at the memory of things that had been said. Oh, if only they knew, said Harry, after Madison had been with them a week. Don't you reckon it's time they did, Harry boy? A joke's a joke, but I'm getting kind of tired sitting around acting the dumb cluck in front of your mummy and daddy. What say we blow the gaff? Harry thought. Mad probably knew best. Come to think of it, Mad probably knew best about most things. He stroked his friend's head. OK, he said. Tomorrow. On the following morning, Mr. and Mrs. Holdsworth woke to the sound of music of a kind. Dimly, there came to their ears the battle hymn of the Republic, played correctly, but very slowly, on the piano, while Harry's voice informed them that John Brown's body lay a mouldering in the grave. I've never heard Harry play a tune before, said his mother. Mm. He plays better than he sings, growled his father, and he pulled the bedclothes over his head. In the kitchen, at breakfast time, he said, Didn't know you were a musician, Harry, didn't you, Dad? Had you practised that before? his mother asked. Oh, oh no, no, it's easy if you know how. Madison, sitting on Harry's shoulder, gave a loud whistle, and Harry began to giggle helplessly. His father looked at him over the top of the Sunday newspaper. Harry, he said, as I've told your mother, sometimes I think you're mad. Harry's giggles got even worse. He began to splutter and snort, and tears ran down his face. No, no, <laughs> that, that's the one with the feathers. <laughs> Eat your egg, said his mother, and don't be silly. Madison looked disapprovingly around the breakfasting family. Not that he had the slightest objection to seeing humans eat, or indeed generally to what they ate. Much of their food, he knew from experience, was delicious, and he must make it clear to young Harry that parrot seed was only for plain common parrots. But if there was one thing that really turned him up, it was to see them eating boiled eggs. It seemed to him that to do so was in the worst possible taste. Yuck, said Madison loudly. Mr. Holsworth put down his newspaper. That bird actually made a noise, he said, that sounded almost like a word. Opposite him, Harry was grinning all over his face. Now what's the joke, said his father. Say good morning, Harry said. I've already said it when I first came downstairs. No, not to me, Dad. Say good morning to Madison. Don't be silly, Harry, his mother said. Let Daddy read his paper in peace. Oh, oh go on, Dad. Mr. Holsworth shook his head resignedly. Well, if I must, he said. He looked at the parrot. Good morning, he said. Good morning, said Madison. Well, I'm blowed, said Mr. Holsworth. When did you learn to say that? Madison had opened his bill to say, oh, about forty years ago, when he saw Harry put his finger to his lips, so he shut it again. So you've actually begun to teach him things, said his mother. You just kept saying it to him till he repeated it. He said it very clearly, didn't he? Yes. Mrs. Hillsworth leant forward. Good morning, Madison, she said. Madison bobbed his head at her. Good morning, Madison, he replied. What a clever old bird you are, she said. What a clever old bird you are, said Madison. Amazing, said Harry's father. He's a natural mimic. We might have known that Uncle George wouldn't have bothered with any old parrot. Isn't it strange, though? Here's this creature repeating what we say word for word, pronouncing everything quite correctly, interrupted Harry's mother, and what's more, if you notice, with a distinct American accent, which he well might, went on her husband, considering that, after all, Uncle George must often have played this sort of game with him, and yet, uh, and this is the point, of course, when it comes to the actual meaning of what we're saying, the bird hasn't got a clue. Isn't that right, my friend? he said to Madison. Not a clue. Not a clue, said Madison gravely. It's a pity they haven't got proper brains like us, isn't it, Dad? I mean, he could help you with the Sunday Times crossword puzzle. Don't be silly, Harry, said his mother, and to her husband. Off you go and settle down with your precious puzzle. Harry, time for you to do the washing up, please. 
Put Madison back in his cage first. Yes, Mum. In the passage between kitchen and sitting room, he stopped for a moment out of earshot of both parents. Mad? Yeah, Harry? Shall we let them into the secret now? I sure hope so, Harry boy. It's kind of weird just repeating stuff all the time. Makes me feel a real dope. OK, Mad, said Harry. But wait till I finish the washing up. I don't want to miss this. He went into the sitting room, where his father was already settled, pipe in mouth, pencil poised, and put Madison into his cage. I hope that bird's going to keep quiet now, Mr. Holsworth said. Oh, he will, Dad, said Harry, grinning. I'm sure. Sure, said Madison. Time passed, and all was Sunday morning peace and silence. The only small sounds were the occasional scratch of Harry's father's pencil and the noise of a page turning as his mother read a book and the cracking of seeds in the parrot cage. Harry came in with mugs of coffee. At that moment, Mr. Holsworth knocked out his pipe and sighed deeply. <sighs> Mrs. Holsworth closed her book. Are you stuck? she said. Mm, it's quite a hard one today, really. Listen to this, for instance. I can't think of a single word in the English language that fits. Blank S, two blanks T, blank C, blank N, blank. What's the clue? Cat, in spite of being a bird. There was another silence, and then... It's an anagram, Mr. Holsworth, sir, said Madison in a respectful voice. Psittacine means belonging to the parrot family. You want I should spell it for you? Only a week had passed, just the space between one Sunday and the next, and yet it seemed to all the family that there had never been a time without Madison. How had they ever managed before, each of them wondered. As for the dog and the cat, they could hardly remember what life had been like before the coming of the stocky grey stranger with a human voice, or rather with a variety of human voices, since Madison might, for example, address either one of them in the tones of any of the three Holsworths. The cat, naturally, but unwisely, had begun by believing the newcomer to be simply a pigeon-sized bird, and, unlike those in the streets outside, which it stalked but never caught, easy meat. Observing that the human soon allowed the parrot out of its cage, the cat waited until they were all out of the way, and then proceeded to creep towards Madison, who was sitting on the arm of a chair, with his back turned. Poor cat! How could it have dreamt what lay in store? How could it have known of those dozens of old gangster films, they were George's favourites, that Madison had watched over the years on TV? George Reft, Jimmy Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, Madison knew them all. But it was Bogart's voice that suddenly fell upon the hunter's astonished ears. A slow voice it was, and sneering, all the more startling because it was not raised. Hold it right there, sweetheart snarled Madison out of the corner of his beak, and the cat, frozen, held it. Slowly, deliberately, Madison turned to face the animal, and then he spoke again, even more softly. Never do that again, fella, he said. You understand? Now beat it. Its hair rising, its tail fluffed out like a bottle brush, the cat began to slink away, and then suddenly, to its horror, there came from Madison's beak the ah, 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 of a Thompson submachine gun and the zing and whine of ricocheting bullets. I had to do it, see, kid, growled Madison afterwards to Harry. It was Johnny the Cat coming to get me. It was him or me, so I let him have it. Mr. Holsworth found Madison an excellent companion when arriving home tired from his day's work. He would switch on the television, and they would watch the early evening news together. Then, afterwards, while Mrs. Holsworth prepared supper and Harry did his homework, they would discuss the main points. Madison had been trained by Professor Holsworth to take an intelligent interest in the strange, often crazy way in which human beings tried to run the world, 
a world which they considered belonged to them, yet they seemed determined to destroy it and themselves with it. Privately, Madison considered that parrots would have made a much better job of things. The second weekend, the Sunday Times crossword never knew what hit it. Together, Madison and Mr. Holdsworth made a perfect team, vying with one another as to who could solve a clue first. Madison was especially strong on anagrams. And indeed, his skills were not solely intellectual. He found, rather to his surprise, for he had no previous experience, that he was a great help in the garden. That strong, hooked beak was the perfect instrument for hoeing out weed seedlings, many of which, Madison discovered, were rather tasty. Side by side, man and parrot worked in the long summer evenings, and they did not speak, lest the neighbours should hear. Madison also turned out to be invaluable to Mrs. Holdsworth. These cookies sure look good, he said, joining her in the kitchen. Cookies? Oh, you made my biscuits. Try one. Mm, delicious, said Madison presently. A shortbread mixture, I always say, should not be overcooked. It should always be this pale golden colour. You're interested in cooking, asked Mrs. Holdsworth. I surely am, ma'am. It was George's hobby. Oh, really? It's mine, too. Perhaps you know some recipes from your part of the world. Harry, coming into the kitchen later, found them deep in conversation. American brownies, Madison was saying. Delicious, squidgy, nutty chocolate bars. We use special unsweetened chocolate, but the plain dessert type will do. And use walnuts, almonds, brazils, whatever you like. You break the chocolate into small pieces and melt it with four ounces of butter in the top of a double saucepan. Hang on, Madison, Mrs. Hellsworth said. Let me write it all down. Madison dictated the recipe, even managing to say, and take two eggs, without faltering. Experience had taught him that we all have to make sacrifices now and then in a good cause. I didn't know you had a sweet tooth, Mrs. Hellsworth said. <laughs> Tell the truth, I don't have a tooth in my head, Mum. But yeah, I'm very fond of that kind of thing. In fact, I'd like to eat nearly everything that people like to eat, if you understand me. Madison, she said, I think I'm going to learn a lot from you. You haven't eaten much of your seed today, Mad, said Harry that evening. Oh, no, said Madison indistinctly, because his mouth was full of delicious, squidgy, Nutty American Brownie. That the little bird's command of language must be kept secret, the family all agreed. It was easy for Harry and his mother, whose conversations with the parrot took place indoors, but more difficult for Mr. Holdsworth, who often came very close to speaking to his fellow gardener. Once, indeed, he leant on his spade and said, "'How's it going, old chap?' But Madison made no reply. On the other hand, they all thought that a completely silent parrot might seem odd to anyone visiting the house. "'Just say, hello,' suggested Harry's father. "'People expect that.' "'I suppose you could say, pretty Polly,' said Harry's mother." Uh, begging your pardon, ma'am, said Madison, but I'd be might obliged if you'd excuse me from saying those particular words. The name does not fit, nor does the description. How about handsome Madison? said Harry. Uh, I'll just stick to hello, if you don't mind, said Madison. And so, when friends or relatives came, he did. He had an uncanny knack, however, for sensing whether visitors were welcome. Those who were received one quiet, hello. But tiresome callers never now stayed long. The word of greeting repeated over and over again, if needs be in a piercing scream sent them rushing from the house. There were times, of course, when Harry was at school, Mr. Holdsworth at work, and Mrs. Holdsworth out. Then, if anyone came to the door, Madison would growl more horribly than the Hound of the Baskervilles, while the dog itself lay admiringly silent. If the phone rang, Madison could never resist picking up the receiver, but he gave nothing away, 
as Mr. Holsworth discovered one morning when ringing from his office to speak to his wife, who had in fact just gone out. He dialed the number and was surprised to be answered in his own voice. Hello, said his own voice. This is an answering service. If you have a message for the Holsworths, please state it slowly and clearly, together with your name and address, when you hear the signal. Thank you for calling. State your message now. There followed three sharp sounds. The noise, in fact, of a parrot's beak tapping on the mouthpiece. Madison, said Mr. Holsworth. There was a pause. Ah, oh, gee. Hello, Mr. Holsworth, sir, said Madison in his natural tones. I didn't expect to hear your voice. I didn't expect to hear my voice either, said Harry's father. Have you done this often? Oh, a couple of times. When Mrs. Holsworth's been out, like she is now, buying stuff for tonight's meal. And, and you give her the message when she comes in? Sure. What's yours, Mr. Holsworth? Um, tell her I may be late home this evening, Madison. I've got a meeting that may go on a bit. Ah, oh, gee, that is tough, Mr. Holsworth. But we'll try and save some for you. Save some what? New Orleans shrimps, Maryland ham and strawberry shortcake. Pity about the meeting. Have a nice day. I thought you said you'd be late home, said Mrs. Holsworth that evening, as her husband walked into a kitchen filled with good sights and smells. I, um, cancel the meeting. Good job you did. Between us, Madison and I have cooked up a rather special meal. I know, said Mr. Holsworth. How do you know, Dad? asked Harry. A little bird told me. The parrot now regularly sat up at table, or rather sat on it, next to Harry. Since he was, through no fault of his own, an untidy eater, Mrs. Holsworth provided him with a tin tray on which he squatted. Bits of dropped food could then be collected later and put in the dog's bowl. To eat, he used a dessert spoon which Harry loaded for him. Standing on one foot, Madison held the spoon in the other and dipped his beak in it in quite an elegant manner. Now he finished the last of the strawberry shortcake and turned to Mr. Holsworth. Ah, oh, that was terrific, he said. It certainly was, said Harry's father. Where did you get all those recipes from? he asked his wife. A little bird told me. Isn't it nice, Harry said to Madison at bedtime. You get on so well with Mum and Dad. Madison settled himself on his perch in the parrot cage. Blood is thicker than water. Sorry? You gotta remember, I am a Holsworth. If not actually by birth, then by adoption. And birds of a feather flock together. Okay, George was a naturalized American, but there's a whole lot about your daddy that reminds me of him. Now, even if he hasn't quite got old George's command of the language. And as for your mommy, well, huh, George could cook a bit, but I guess she's the greatest. That strawberry shortcake, wow! You sure got the nicest folks, Harry boy. Harry made no reply to this speech, and it was a mark of the closeness which their friendship had already reached that Madison read his thoughts immediately and correctly. But, said the parrot firmly, you and me, Harry, we're buddies. Gosh, Mad, said Harry, I don't know what I'd do without you. Time passed, and Madison settled even more comfortably into the bosom of the family. The Christmas term had started, and Harry was back at school. Mr. Holsworth was at work, and Mrs. Holsworth was going out to do some shopping. Anything you need before I go, Madison? All right, I'm off then. I'm taking the dog to give him some exercise. See you soon. Sure thing, said Madison. But it wasn't. A quarter of an hour passed. Everything was very quiet, and in the warm kitchen, Madison dozed on the Daily Mail. Suddenly, there was a noise. It sounded as though it came from the sitting room. It was quite a light, tinkling noise, a noise of something breakable, breaking. Ah, oh, now what's that lame-brained Kit Kat up to? said Madison, hopping off the kitchen table and making his way down the passage. Smashed one of Mrs. H.'s little ornaments, if I ain't mistaken. But he was mistaken, as he found when he waddled into the sitting room. It was not an ornament that was broken. It was a window, 
and climbing over the windowsill was not the cat, but a man. He was not a big, ugly roughneck as a burglar ought to be, with a striped jersey and a black mask and a sack-marked swag. He was small and neat and dressed in a smart suit, and he carried a leather grip. Madison hid behind the door. Moving quickly and silently on rubber-soled shoes, the burglar reached out and closed it with a gloved hand. Madison stood revealed. "'Who's an otter boy, then?' he said in the squawky tones of an ordinary talking parrot. The burglar did not find it necessary to reply to this question. Instead, he opened the zip fastener of his grip, and after one quick practice look about the room, made straight for an old heavy sideboard, in the drawers and cupboards of which Mrs. Holdsworth kept all the silver. Knives, spoons and forks, cream jugs and sauce boats, candlesticks, coasters and salvers, and one especially handsome chased silver rose bowl, Madison had seen them all when they were brought out for cleaning, and knew that they were much the most valuable things in the house. Stop, thief! he said loudly. The burglar turned from examining the hallmark of the rose bowl. Shut up, you stupid bird, or do you want me to shut you up? And Madison and did not find it necessary to reply to this question. Instead, he fluttered up onto the sill of the open window and took a deep breath. Help! Burglars! Thieves! Robbers! Footpads! Cut purses! Fire! Murder! Police! Help! Behind him, he heard a clutter as the burglar dropped the rose bowl and then felt hands grasp him. Into the blackness of the leather grip he went. Zip went the fastener. Bump went his head against the window sill as the burglar fled. And Madison, for once in his long life, was reduced to silence. Dimly, he was conscious of a car door slamming, of engine noise, of a bumpy stop-start journey in what sounded like heavy traffic. And later, the grip was lifted out, and he felt himself carried up. He could hear stairs being climbed and put down. The zip was unfastened. By now... Madison's head had cleared, and after a moment he stuck it out. He was in a small bed sitting room, its door shut, its window curtained. The burglar was sitting on the bed regarding him, frowning to himself and rubbing his chin in thought. I ought to have knocked you on the head, he said. Madison was tempted to say, you did, but preserve silence. Messed up this morning's work properly, you have. Still... I can easily pop back another day. There's some nice stuff there, and at least you ought to fetch a bob or two. Parrots are pricey birds, if I'm not mistaken, especially ones that have learnt as many words as you seem to have. Which reminds me, don't start any of that yelling again, or you will cop it. Not that you can understand a thing I'm saying. He stood up and walked to a table with a telephone on it. He dialed a number. Madison listened carefully. Mr. Locke, please, said the burglar. Mr. Ware here. There was a pause. Hello. That you, Johnny? Silver speaking. Silver Ware. Wonder if you could do me a favour. I've got a little item for sale, Johnny. No, no, not my usual line. It's a parrot. I just happened to pick up a parrot. Though he could not distinguish the words, Madison could hear the tone of surprise in the answering voice. That's right, a parrot, said Silver. And he's a good talker. And I thought to myself, old Johnny fences for all the burglars in town, whatever their speciality. He's sure to know some guy in the bird business. Uh, you do? Oh, that's great. Get him to give me a buzz, will you, Johnny? Thanks a million. I might have some nice stuff for you in the next week or so. Bye now. Silverware put the phone down, wrote with a silver pencil a name and address in a notebook, pulled from his waistcoat a silver pocket watch on a silver chain and said thoughtfully, Time for a little drink. He shot his cuffs to show their silver links, adjusted the silver pin in his tie and made for the door. Shan't be long, he said to Madison in passing. If the phone rings, you can answer it. <laughs> and went out of the room. After the door had closed, Madison waited until the footsteps had died away down the stairs, and then he came out of the grip. The window, he found by climbing up the curtains and peering between them, was firmly latched. He examined the fireplace. In it, 
stood an electric fire of imitation logs, and behind this, screening the chimney, was a sheet of plasterboard. To keep out the draft that comes down the chimney, thought Madison. And if drafts can come down, parrots can go up, I guess. And he set to work on the plasterboard with his beak. Before long, he had prized one edge of it away, and peering up, could see to his joy a distant circle of sky above. At that moment, the phone rang. Backing out of the fireplace, Madison fluttered up to the table and picked up the receiver. Hello, he said in the burglar's voice. Silverware speaking. Happy Wings home for birds here, said the caller. Johnny Locke said a ring. You got a parrot for sale? That's right. What kind? African grey. Good talker? Good talker, said Madison. Why, this bird knows words you've never even heard of. This bird, though I say it myself, is the handsomest, most intelligent parrot in the world, bar none. Have you got him, Andy? Yeah, said Madison. Hang on a minute. I'll put him on the line. He waited ten seconds, and then in a parrot's rasp he said, God save the Queen! Rule Britannia! Land of hope and glory! You got a face like a chicken's bum! See what I mean? he said in Silver's voice. What's he worth to you? Hmm, I'd have to have a deco at him first. Where are you? I wish I knew, said Madison to himself, and aloud. Uh, no, I'd sooner bring him over to you. Give me your address. The conversation finished. Madison was about to make for the fireplace and freedom when it occurred to him that he must not pass up this opportunity to let Harry know he was safe. He picked up the receiver again with one foot and dialed the Holdsworth's number with the hook of his beak. The line was engaged. Madison glanced at a small silver carriage clock that stood on the bedside table. Mr. Ware had already been gone for twenty minutes. At least, thought Madison, I must repay his hospitality before I take my leave. He dialed again, this time 999. Which service do you require, said the operator. Police. Presently, a voice said, Police. What seems to be the trouble? I've been kidnapped. I see, sir. Where are you speaking from? I don't know. You don't know where you are? No. Uh, what number are you speaking from? Madison read it off the dial. Well, we can soon trace that. Now, about this kidnapping, sir, who has kidnapped you? Listen, buddy, said Madison, and listen good. I'm kind of pushed for time. The guy who snatched me lives here. Trace this number and you'll soon find him. He's a small-time hoodlum name of Silver Ware, and I guess you may find some interesting stuff here. And while you're about it, he might lead you to a receiver of stolen property called Johnny Luck. Now, on top of that... If you're interested in valuable missing birds, try Happy Wings Home. And he recited the address. Got all that? Yes, indeed. Thank you, sir. Very public-spirited of you. You have an American accent, sir, I think. I sure do. Though, to tell the truth, I'm African. I see, sir. You're a black American. Well, grey, actually. Could I have some more details, sir? Y you're tied up. Nope. Free as a bird. You're locked in a room. No, door's not locked. Why don't you open it? Can't reach the handle, Buster. I ain't tall enough. And there was a pause. Now, look here, my friend. You're telling me that you are quite free and unharmed in a room whose door is not locked, but you're too short to reach the door handle. Suppose you tell me exactly how tall you are. Madison, by now, was tired of being questioned, nettled by the policeman's tone and anxious to go. OK, buddy boy, he said. You ask for it. I'm nine inches. At that moment, Madison heard the door close downstairs and then the sound of footsteps climbing towards him. I gotta go. Up the flipping chimney, I suppose, said the policeman sarcastically. You're dead right, mister, said Madison and went. <laughs> Sit down a minute, Harry his mother said when he returned from school. Just listen while I tell you what's happened. I went out shopping this morning. I wasn't out long, less than half an hour. But when I got home, I found we'd had a burglar. One of the sitting-room window panes, the one nearest the catch, had been broken from the outside, and bits of glass were on the carpet. 
Someone had smashed it and reached through and opened the window. It was wide open. Has he stolen lots of stuff? No, he'd obviously been after the silver. The sideboard cupboards were open and my rose bowl was lying on the floor. But that wasn't what he took. What did he take then? Listen to me, Harry. You're going to have to be very grown up about this. It's Madison who's missing. Oh, no, Mum. Yes, now listen. First of all, I'm sure he won't have been harmed. Whoever took him wouldn't want to hurt him. Why would they take him, then? Parrots are valuable animals, you know. Priceless, I suppose, in Madison's case, if anyone had known how clever he is. But even a parrot that can only say a few words could be worth between two and three hundred pounds, the police said. The police came? Yes, and interviewed the people across the road, who said they'd heard somebody yelling for help, which must have been Madison. You didn't tell them? Oh, no! I said it must have been a passer-by who'd seen the break-in. Does Dad know? Yes, he should be here soon. He's coming home early. He's putting advertisements in the papers offering a reward. Try not to worry, darling. I'm sure we'll find your old Mad. The evening was not a happy one. Mr. Holdsworth watched the six o'clock news alone. It was, as usual, filled with gloomy items, but his mind was on a gloomier one. Harry's homework was a messy mass of mistakes. Mrs. Holdsworth, laying the table, automatically put out Madison's tray and spoon before she realised what she was doing. After supper, Harry could bear the sight of the empty parrot cage no longer. He said his good nights and went to bed. Never in his life had he felt so wretched. Mad, he said in the darkness. Where are you? In point of fact, at that moment, Madison was halfway up a very dirty chimney. Like all parrots, he was using his beak as well as his feet to climb, and his mouth was full of salt. But he clambered doggedly upward, taking some pleasure in the angry cries of silverware below, and a last desperate fluttering saw him free. Black now as the night around him, Madison perched unsteadily on the rim of one of London's millions of chimney pots. Man, he said in the darkness, where are you? As if to be lost, hungry and filthy were not hardship enough, the puckish gods of the weather now saw fit to play their part in cutting the handsomest, most intelligent parrot in the world, bar none, down to size. A freezing wind blew and rain poured down, chilled to the bone, black as any crow, and now as flightless as a penguin, Madison fell helplessly from his perch, off the chimney stack, down the slippery slope of the tiled roof, over the edge to the street below. Shocked, shaken and shivering, somehow he managed to crawl from the road into the shelter of a doorway, out of the wind and the rain. There, Awaiting the collection of the refuse collectors was a stack of rubbish composed mainly of cardboard boxes, and into one of these Madison crept with the last of his strength. Quite early next morning, the dust cart came down the street. At each bin, or in doorways or areas where rubbish was stacked, one or other of three dustmen would pick up a load and shoot it into the back of the vehicle. Inside, a giant metal screw rotated endlessly, smashing and squashing to pulp everything that came its way. Madison came its way, still out to the world in the cardboard box that promised to be his coffin, as it jiggled and shuffled towards destruction. Suddenly, one of the dustmen spotted him and shouted a warning, and in the nick of time, another pulled him clear. I thought I'd seen something live, shouted the first dustman. It's a bird, isn't it? said the second dustman. A dead bird. It's ever butchers. Funny kind of bird. Ah, just an old jackdaw. Funny kind of jackdaw with a beak like that. Show him to old Claude. He knows about animals, old Claude does. Old Claude was the driver of the dust cart, a big, bald gentleman. He looked down from the window of his cab. What's up? he said. It's a bird, isn't it? 
said the second dustman. A dead bird! Claude took the limp body in one large hand. With the other, he pulled a bunch of rags from under the dash and began carefully to wipe the sticky blackness from the matted feathers. Gradually, Madison began to appear in his true colours, the grey of his plumage, the bright red tail feathers, the white face, until only the beak remained, as ever, black. And gradually, in the warmth of Claude's grasp, and under the stimulus of his massaging, a little spark of life began to glimmer faintly once again in Madison's body. It was only a tiny spark, just enough to allow one eye to open for a second. But Claude saw it, and began to smile. Standing in the road below, the three dustmen could not see the transformation taking place, but only the broad grin that spread gradually over Claude's face. Well, they said. Claude looked down at them. This here bird, he said, is a African grey parrot. Good talkers. That one's never going to talk no more, they said. Carefully, Claude tucked Madison inside his donkey jacket. I hope, said Claude, he is. Afterwards, Madison remembered nothing of that morning. He was unaware at the end of the round of the attention he received in the warmth of Claude's cosy kitchen, of the gentle bathing away of the last of the soot from his plumage, of the blanket-wrapped hot water bottles that were folded around him, of the heated milk laced with a drop of brandy that was tipped down him. He simply slept. At last, in the evening, a full twenty-four hours since his chimney climb, he opened both eyes to see a face peering down at him. It was a kindly face, Madison instantly decided, and out of it came a kindly voice. Hello, said the voice. I hope you're better. Madison considered how best to answer this courteous inquiry without revealing his gifts. He decided upon a simple, polite affirmative. Yes, thank you, he squawked. Hungry? said Claude. Yes, thank you, said Madison again. I haven't got bird seed, said Claude. Like an apple? Yes, thank you. By making use of this reply to everything that was offered, Madison made an excellent supper, eating until he could eat no more. Had enough? asked Claude. Yes, thank you. An egg. How do you fancy a boiled egg? Madison decided this was the moment to extend his vocabulary. No, thank you, he said. And indeed, as the days passed and turned into weeks, he found that thank you, with or without a yes or a no, served to answer most of the questions that the big, bald-headed man asked him. Otherwise, he kept silent. It was a strain, a severe strain upon such a natural conversationalist, but he was resolute, set upon three objectives. To regain his health and strength, to fly this nest, and then to find a telephone, Claude hadn't one, and contact Harry. So... Much as he would have loved a chat with his kind host, he resisted the temptation. Once he was nearly caught out. From behind the evening paper which he was reading, Claude had suddenly quietly said, Madison? Despite himself, Madison half opened his beak to reply and then quickly closed it again. Claude peered over the paper. Thought you might be called Madison, he said. No, thank you, said Madison, crossing his toes. There's an ad here, said Claude. Oldsworth. Lost. African grey parrot. Name of Madison. And some reward. And then a box number. Oh, I'm glad it's not you. Sure as my name's Claude Clutterbuck. But when a month had gone by, Madison decided that the time had come to leave. He made his decision with great regret. Claude Clutterbuck, you're a swell guy, he thought and I wish there was some way I could repay you for all your kindness. One thing's sure, I'll make certain you get that handsome reward, but home I gotta go. Now he waited for the right weather conditions, listening carefully to the forecasts on Claude's radio for the combination he wanted. And one evening it came. In the London area, said the weatherman, the following day would be unusually mild for the time of year, windless and dry. I sure feel a dirty heel, 
muttered Madison as he took off, skimming over Claude's bald head and out through the open window. He circled around and then swooped low for the last two words. Thank you, shouted Madison, and away he flew, higher and higher over the dingy rooftops. Good heavens, said Claude, as he stared up at the disappearing bird. Holly, my hat. For the first couple of weeks after Madison's disappearance, Mr Holsworth had made every possible effort to find him. The advertisements he had placed brought no replies, so he telephoned every London pet shop in the Yellow Pages. Quite a number had African grey parrots for sale, several recently acquired, and these he went to see. He did not tell Harry, preferring to take upon himself the disappointment of saying, Madison? and getting either a foolish reply or none. One bird, in Harrod's zoo, did actually respond to his question sensibly enough to give him momentary hope. It had apparently been brought up in upper-class surroundings by someone who could not sound the letter R correctly. Madison, Mr. Holsworth had said. Without hesitation, it had replied, Terribly, terribly sorry if we're not. It was the kind of posh, silly-ass accent that Madison could put on with ease, and just for a second he wondered. Mad, is it you? Stop fooling about, he said, but the parrot only answered, dreadfully sorry, and turned away, leaving him feeling stupid. But when three weeks had gone by, Harry's father made up his mind on a course of action that was bold, decisive, well-meant. He would buy a replacement for Madison for Harry's birthday. So when the day came, he simply went back to Harrod's zoo and bought the parrot. He did not tell his wife, who would certainly have advised against such a plan. He did not tell Harry, wanting to give him a nice surprise. "'You'll have to wait until this evening for your present, Harry,' his father said. "'I'm picking it up after work.' "'He wouldn't even tell me what we're giving you,' his mother said at tea-time, watching Harry, thinking how he'd changed since his tenth birthday. The old pre-Madison Harry would have been in a fever of excitement and impatience by now, showing off, being silly, roaring round the house, imagining all sorts of fantastic presents.' But how much more sensible he had grown, trying harder at school, acting more thoughtfully at home, all since Madison had come. Now he'd gone, leaving behind him yet another Harry, quiet and reserved. She watched him picking listlessly at his birthday cake from a Madison recipe. "'Isn't it nice, Harry?' she said. "'Yes, thanks. Dad'll be home soon. Yes. "'Cheer up, darling. Things could be worse.' And before long, they were. When Mr. Holsworth arrived home, he put his head round the kitchen door and said, Stay there a minute, you two. Don't come into the sitting room till I call. In a little while, he called, and they came. On the table was a box. Harry's father raised the lid. For a moment or two, nothing happened. Then, out of the box, in silent, slow motion, there rose a round, grey head with a sharp, hooked beak. On either side of the head was a bright, considering, straw-coloured eye. Mrs. Holsworth drew in her breath smartly. Oh, she cried, it's not, no, said Harry, it's not. No, I'm afraid it isn't, said Mr. Holsworth, but I thought you'd like to have him, Harry. He talks a bit, and I'm sure you could teach him lots of words. And anyway, well, half a loaf's better than no bread, eh? Yes, Dad, thanks. Thank you both, it's very kind of you. His mother plunged in hastily. He looks awfully like Madison, don't you think? Doesn't he, said his father heartily. I mean, all parrots look alike, don't they? There was a long, uncomfortable silence. I've done a stupid thing, Mr. Holsworth thought, but I meant well. You'll have to think of a name for it, he said. I'm sure he meant well, Mrs. Holsworth thought, but what a stupid thing to do. Perhaps it's got one already, she said brightly. She bent forward. Have you got a name, old boy? Terribly, terribly sorry. Afraid not, said the parrot. The days passed, and Harry did his best to appear pleased with his birthday present, the last thing in the world he would have chosen. He realised that his father, with the kindest of intentions, must have spent a great deal of money to try and comfort him for the loss of Mad, 
and he tried hard not to show how much worse it had actually made things. He looked after his new pet carefully, but he could feel nothing for him. He was just a parrot in a cage. Harry could hardly bring himself to speak to the bird, though by now he had a name. Because of the affected way he spoke like a chinless wonder, somebody suggested Fweddy, and for lack of a better idea, it stuck. Mr. and Mrs. Holdsworth made attempts to hold conversations with Fweddy, but without much success. True, he would speak in reply to their efforts, but only to say he was terribly sorry, or occasionally by way of a change, frightfully fooled. He also had a limited range of comments about the weather, which occasionally, by chance, made sense. But he was perfectly capable of saying on a fine sunny day that it was raining cats and dogs, or freezing cold. And once, when the heavens opened and a downpour drummed against the window panes, Fweddy cried cheerfully, Grand weather for the time of year! Roasting hot! Quite tropical, what? He also responded to the ringing of the telephone, saying, Answer the wretched thing, darling! I'm too weary to lift the receiver! By chance, one morning, about a week after his birthday, Harry was alone in the house when the telephone rang. Answer the wretched thing, darling! said Fweddy. I'm too weary to lift the receiver! Hello, said Harry in the flat, bored tones that were now customary to him. "'I have a call for Harry Holdsworth,' said the operator. "'That's me. "'It's a reverse charge call from a Mr Madison Holdsworth. "'Will you accept the charges?' <laughs> Madison flew higher and higher into the quiet sky of a pleasant, sunny, late October morning and surveyed the bit of London that lay below him, he was looking for landmarks. Mad, said Mad. Take it easy, fella. Get your breath and use your brains. Examine the pros and cons of the situation. Make a plan. Act on it. On the plus side, you are free. You will return to health. You are somewhere in London. Harry is somewhere in London. On the minus, you're lost. So what do you do? You contact Harry. You've got to fix a meeting place, a rendezvous. Some point that you and Harry can both find easy. OK, let's find a telephone. Oh, yeah? You're going to open the door of a telephone box with your lousy beak, huh? Or are you going to smash one of its windows like vandals do? Hey, wait a minute, buddy boy. That's it. That's the answer. Go find a vandalized public telephone box. Oh, Madison Holdsworth, you ain't just a pretty face. Let's go! He was not long in discovering his first telephone box, but when he flew down to it, he found it occupied. And of the next two he investigated, one was empty but in good repair, so that there was no way in for him, and the other had been just too thoroughly vandalised. But at last, after several disappointments, his luck turned. He had flown across the green turf of what he knew from television was a football stadium, and just beyond it he found what he wanted. Standing beneath a street sign that read White Hart Lane was a box that was both empty and undamaged, except that someone had thoughtfully kicked in one of the lower panes of glass. Madison crept in and fluttered up onto the top of the coin box. He picked up the receiver and dialed a hundred. "'What number do you require?' said the operator. "'I want to make a reverse charge call,' said Madison, and he gave the Holdsworth's number and Harry's name. Then there were buzzings and clickings and a ringing tone, and at last, Harry's voice. "'Harry?' "'Mad! Mad! Is it really you? What's happened? Where have you been? Are you all right? Yeah, I'm just fine. Tell you all about it when we meet. Gee, it's great to hear you, Harry boy. Oh, Mad! Where are you? Somewhere called White Hart Lane. Oh, gosh, that's North London, miles from here. Then I'll be like the swallows, said Madison. I'll fly south for winter. I figure all we gotta do is fix a spot to meet. Trafalgar Square, Harry exclaimed. Listen, Mad, you're some way north of the river, say seven or eight miles as the crow flies. Uh, the parrot. <laughs> yeah, listen, just fly south till you see the Thames. You'll see Trafalgar Square just on your side of the river. You can't miss it. There's the column and the fountains and the four lions, one at each corner. I'll meet you there. I'll leave a note for Mum and get the first train I can for Charing Cross. It'll probably take me about an hour. We should get there about the same time. <laughs> Ha! 
Harry, called Mrs Holdsworth, arriving home. I'm sorry I'm late. I'm afraid you've had to wait for your lunch. There was no answer. Harry, she said again. Are you there? Fwed not, said a voice. Terribly, terribly sorry. Propped up on the kitchen table was a note. Mum, mad rang, going to London to fetch him, back for tea. How about making some American brownies? Love, Harry. Oh, dear, she said aloud. I hope to goodness he'll be all right. Harry, in fact, was quite all right, only a bit out of breath. He had run all the way to Mays Hill Station, hoping that there would soon be a train for Charing Cross. And there was, and he was on it. But when he entered Trafalgar Square, Harry's heart sank. How would he ever find mad amongst this multitude of pigeons? He sat down on a bench, while the pigeons chuckled and gobbled around his feet, and stared unhappily at the column, pointing like a colossal finger into the London sky. His gaze was drawn up the mighty pillar, up, up to the pedestal, on its top where stood the figure of the little admiral, cocked hat on his head, his one and only hand resting upon the hilt of his sword. But what was the shape that sat upon the epauletted shoulder of Horatio, Viscount Nelson and Duke of Bronte, KCB, Vice Admiral of the Blue? That was no silly pigeon! Mad! 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 And everywhere people stopped and stared at this yelling, dancing small boy who shouted endlessly the word that, it seemed to them, he was. And as they watched, a solitary bird came gliding rather clumsily down from the heights and pitched awkwardly upon the boy's shoulder and shuffled sideways to nibble very gently at the lobe of his ear. And the boy stopped his shouting and stood still, only raising one hand to stroke with his fingertips that round grey head, while all around the pigeons settled again and the noise of their cooing once more filled the square. After that, everything went like clockwork. They couldn't talk much. There were too many people about, in the crowded streets, on the packed platform, on the journey through Waterloo and the Elephant and Castle, on the way to Greenwich and home. And then they were at the door, and Harry's mother was opening it and hugging him and stroking Madison's feathers and hurrying them into the kitchen and plying them with delicious, squidgy, nutty American brownies and endless questions. And they were still all talking away, nineteen to the dozen, when Harry's father arrived home, astounded to see Madison, who then had to tell the story of his adventures all over again. Until at last, Mr Holdsworth looked at his watch and said, Mad? Nearly time for the six o'clock news. And they all smiled, because one of Madison's tricks was to balance on top of the TV set, swing his tail up and his beak down, and press the on-off switch with the hook of his beak. Sure thing, Mr. Holdsworth, sir, said Madison. I'm out of touch with what's been going on. No knowing what might have happened while I've been away. And he got down onto the floor and waddled along the passage to the sitting room. The smile that had been on Harry's face suddenly changed into a look of horror. Not once, all day, had he thought of Fweddy. Mad, he cried. Hang on a minute. And he dashed out of the kitchen. What's biting you, Harry? asked Madison turning to face him in the doorway of the sitting-room. "'Listen, Matt, I should have told you, it, it just never crossed my mind. I was so excited at seeing you and hearing all your news, I just never thought to say. It was a present from Dad. I never wanted it. I'm sorry.' "'Terribly, terribly, frightfully, dreadfully sorry,' said a voice from the sitting-room. In the silence that followed, you could have heard a parrot's pin-feather drop. Then Madison turned and walked in. He looked up at his cage. Fweddy looked down. Helplessly, Harry looked on. Madison gave a long, low whistle. Fweddy replied with a short, high screech. Harry was tongue-tied. "'Come on, Harry boy, make with the introductions,' said Madison pleasantly. "'Um, he's called Fweddy,' mumbled Harry. Uh, "'Fweddy, this is Madison.' "'Blistering hot, what?' said Fweddy. He doesn't talk sense, said Harry hastily. Honestly, Mad, he's an idiotic bird. We'll get rid of him. We'll sell him straight away tomorrow. We'll take him to a pet shop. Dad won't mind, I'm sure. His parents came into the room. Dad won't mind what, said his father. Hey, Mad, you haven't switched the news on. Terribly, terribly sorry, said Madison, in Fweddy's high, affected voice. What 
a silly poet I am! And to the amazement of the Holsworths, both birds suddenly burst out laughing. When he reached his office on the Friday, Mr Holsworth rang the police to enquire if anything further had been heard of the thief who had broken into his house, and was told that a character called Silver Ware had indeed been found to be in possession of a quantity of stolen valuables, and had been arrested. He also made a call to the local authority to trace the address of one of their dustmen, a Mr Claude Clutterbuck. Then he sent him, anonymously, the reward he'd had in mind of fifty pounds. "'Handsome indeed!' said Madison in Claude's voice when he heard about this. "'He'll he his other hat!' On Monday, when the second half of term began, Harry went back to school with a light heart, looking forward to the evening's homework. As for Harry's mother, she was very keen on the idea of a special meal, a feast in honour of Madison's homecoming. But he said he would rather wait a while. "'When would you like it, then?' she asked. Uh, if it's all the same to you, ma'am, said Madison, how about in a few weeks' time? Say, the fourth Thursday of November. Mrs. Holsworth was puzzled, but agreed. Maybe it's his birthday, she thought. All this time, nothing had been decided about Fweddy. Mr. Holsworth had asked Harry what he wanted to do, and Harry asked Madison, and Madison, surprisingly, had seemed quite happy with things as they were. You can't just show Fweddy the door, he said. The board's happy here. And it's company for me, night times. And indeed, each night they perch side by side in the big parrot cage in the most companionable way. Harry would say good night on his way to bed, and Madison would answer sensibly. Fweddy, on the other hand, would either offer his usual apology or make some silly remark about the weather. But before long he surprised Harry one evening by not only saying good night, but actually adding sweet dreams. "'You're teaching that bird a thing or two, aren't you, Mad?' Harry said next morning at breakfast. And Madison paused, his spoonful of porridge sweetened with golden syrup halfway to his beak. He looked smug. "'You're going to be surprised one of these days.' "'But how do you communicate?' asked Mr. Holsworth. "'I mean, it's not as though he can understand English like you. He's just picked up the odd sentence.' "'It's simple if you think about it. I'm bilingual.' "'What's that mean?' said Harry. I speak two languages. What's the other one, then? Parrot. So you think Fwed is going to astonish us, do you, Matt? asked Mrs. Hellsworth. Given time, ma'am, given time. How long? said Harry. A couple of weeks, I guess. A couple of weeks later, Mrs. Hellsworth looked at the calendar. It was Tuesday, November the 26th, and the 28th had a ring round it to remind her that it was the fourth Thursday of the month. Mad? she called from the kitchen. Can you spare a minute? Sure, shouted Madison from the parrot cage. Its door was always open, but Fweddy seldom ventured out, and Madison, the family noticed, seemed quite happy to keep him company for long spells. They would chatter softly together in parrot language. About this feast, Mad, said Harry's mother when Madison arrived in the kitchen. You wanted it on the fourth Thursday. That's the day after tomorrow. We ought to be thinking about it. Oh, gee, ma'am! What with one thing and another, it went clean out of my head. Mighty glad you remembered. Is it your birthday? No, no, it's Thanksgiving Day. Oh, an American national holiday, isn't it? Yeah. I just thought it'd be kind of nice to celebrate my return home on that particular day. It would, said Mrs. Holsworth. We will. So they began to plan the meal. When Thursday evening came, and the Thanksgiving supper was almost ready, Madison came shuffling into the kitchen. "'We eating in here, ma'am?' "'We always eat in the kitchen, Madison,' said Harry's mother. "'You know that?' "'Sure, sure. But it's just that, well, I, I figured Fweddy might like to come along. Seems kind of tough to be left in there while we're all having a good time.' "'Of course, Mad. I'll lay a place for him.' Madison went back to the sitting-room, where Harry and his father were playing a game. "'Supper nearly ready,' said Mr. Holsworth. Yes, sir. Mrs. Holsworth is kind enough to say Fweddy can come along, too. Do you hear that, Fweddy? said Harry. You're invited to the Thanksgiving supper. Fweddy, I'm not terribly hungry, said Fweddy. I must say, Mad, 
You've done wonders with that bird, said Harry's father. Madison scratched the side of his face. You ain't seen nothing yet, he said. At that moment, Mrs. Holsworth called. Supper's ready. Come on, Freddy, said Harry. There are lots of lovely things to eat. Carry me, Harry, said Freddy. I'm feeling fragile. When they were all sitting down, Freddy on a second tray beside Madison's, Mr. Holsworth poured a glass of wine for his wife and one for himself and a Coke for Harry. Now then, he said to his family, I ask you to raise your glasses and drink a toast. Let's begin this splendid feast by giving thanks for the safe return of Harry's mad. To Harry's mad, they all cried, and then they fell to work with a will. Only Fweddy seemed to have no appetite. Fweddy, said Harry's mother, you're not eating anything. Tell me sorry. But for Harry and Mad, who both loved sweet things, the best part of the meal was the Thanksgiving pudding, a favourite of Great Uncle George's, for which Madison had supplied the recipe, full of figs and raisins and masses of brown sugar. At last everyone had finished eating, and Mrs. Holsworth was just about to ask for help with the washing up, when suddenly Fweddy, who had hardly spoken a word throughout, but had simply sat, looking rather uncomfortable upon the tray, gave a kind of grunt and stood up. And there, to the Holsworth's amazement, was a small, glistening, pearly white, new-laid egg. The Holsworths looked at Fweddy. They looked at the egg. They looked at Madison. Call me Fweddewika, said Fweddy. Call me Dad, said Harry's mad. <laughs>